Hello folks, uh, welcome to episode 2 of Get the Tories Out, the podcast dedicated to explaining the very many obvious reasons why we should get the Tories out of power. Um, I'm your host Graham Rayner and uh, apologies for the delay in getting this episode out. It's been uh, well over a week since the first episode was out, it's actually two weeks now I think. Um, and uh, the reason for that delay is two reasons. First of all, I spent most of the last week on holiday in Prague with my wife. Um, had a great time, Did ver- visited various attractions, including the Sex Machines Museum. Um, nearly didn't get out of there in one piece. They actually asked me if I would stay as a live exhibit. Uh, so, yeah. Um, I also managed to squeeze in a gig, a uh, comedy gig. Uh, I got paid in beer, but it still counts. So I'm now technically an international comedian, which is good. Um, but got back on, on late on Thursday. Um, on Friday, recorded the interview with our guest this week. Um, and that comes, reaches, uh, here we reach reason two for the delay and getting the episode out because we recorded the interview and then right at the very end of the upload failed. Um, I've managed to rescue the backup uh, recording, which means that if you're watching online um, as a, in video format, then you might see um, the quality is not quite, you know, it might not quite look as good as you'd hope. If you're listening, you shouldn't notice too much difference. I might have done a bit of editing to sort it all out. Um, still got our regular features um, of uh, what's happened in the news and a Tory in focus, but the main part of this, the main chunk of this, is, uh, is an interview with uh, the lady who used to be my MP here in Dewsbury, the former Labour MP for Dewsbury in West Yorkshire, uh, Paula Sheriff. Uh, Paula, uh, as you'll hear, uh, made history um, in Parliament. She's the first backbencher to get an amendment to a to a, 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 a budget by the party in power, first opposition back bench, bench, I should say, um, normally wouldn't be considered. And uh, she also um, talks about uh, a couple of times that she confronted a particularly well-known politician, um, once that certainly made the news and once that, that didn't happen behind closed doors, but she shares the story of that. And both of those those incidents are quite telling about that person. Um, you probably already know who I'm talking about, let's be honest. Uh, yeah, it's a really good interview. You will notice as well that um, uh, Paula, bless her, had a really bad cold at the time of recording, so she's sort of coughing and spluttering, but she soldiers on bravely, as she is wont to do. Um, and uh, I think she's fantastic. She's a great MP, and I'm really pleased that she's agreed to come on. And uh, she's also um, the main reason why this podcast is called Get the Tories Out and not, as I had originally planned, Fuck the Tories. That was going to be the original name when I was trying to be a bit of an edgelord about it because that's my genuine sort of sentiment really but it's not that tolerant it's not it's not that appropriate really it was a bit sort of immature of me i suppose to consider calling it that so uh rebranded before we'd even launched to get the tories out um and uh yeah i think it was a sensible move so thanks to paula who basically said she really wanted to come on and do the pod but she was never going to be able to do it um while it was called fuck the tories so well done, Paula, for making me see sense. Um, just a few other bits of admin. Um, I, my, you know, my main sort of reason for for being on social media, etc., is to promote the comedy work that I do. And I am, uh, I have a couple of comedy nights launching. I'm hosting a regular monthly comedy night in Wakefield at the establishment, which starts this week on Friday, the twenty fourth of February. Um, I'm also um, hosting quarterly gigs at Dewsbury Town Hall um, with very well-known and well-respected headline acts and some really superb support acts. Uh, the first one of those gigs is on the 25th of March, Saturday the 25th of March, and superb Brennan Reese is headlining. Uh, Brennan is fantastic. He's been on uh, various TV shows, things like Comedy Roast, Live at the Apollo, Celebrity Coach Trip. He's superb. Um, and for all of the tickets um, that I am selling through my website, any listeners to this podcast can get them half price currently. So, Go to the website, pick a gig. If I am selling the tickets directly and it's not being sold by the venue or the third party, you'll be able to buy tickets on the website. Enter the code GTTO, that's GTTO, Golf Tango Tango Oscar, at checkout in the coupon box and you'll get 50% off all tickets. Not sure how long I'll keep that on there for, so get them all you can. Um, That's my thank you to listeners for this pod. Excellent. So, uh, without further ado, we'll go to the In The News section. Cheers. Thank you. 
So first up this week, we have um, a rather unfortunate footballing incident concerning the leader of the Scottish Conservatives, Douglas Ross. Uh, Douglas Ross isn't only the leader of the Scottish Conservatives, he is also um, uh, what I would call a linesman, but what these days is called a referee's assistant. Um, and here's what happened to him this week. <laughs> So what you see there is a banner at Celtic Park. Um, so Glasgow Celtic were playing St Mirren in the Scottish Cup and uh, Douglas Ross was one of the assistant referees. He was running the line with his little flag and the uh, Celtic fans unfurled this banner. VAR verdict, Douglas Ross is a cunt. Um, not the wittiest, but certainly sends a message I think to the Scottish Conservatives there has been some outcry about the suitability of this at a football game um, and I kind of get that but um, I do feel like it made when I first saw it my natural inclination was to have a little chuckle as someone who goes to the football a lot and as someone who sometimes dishes out a little bit of verbal to the assistant referees who are just in front of where I sit um, I think if I was at Huddersfield Town on this Saturday watching Huddersfield Town play Birmingham and the linesman in front ended up being Rishi Sunak. I might give him a few uh, a few pointers on where I think he was going wrong, not only in the football, but in the way that he's running the Conservative Party and the country. So um, I do get it. Um, I, I, what I would say is that, um, you know, I don't think VAR would be needed. Um, if I'm honest, I think VAR probably redundant in that situation. Um, but uh, yeah, fair play to the Celtic fans. Um, making a statement, you know, maybe um, maybe being the leader of one of the country's major political parties in, in Scotland and being a football referee or assistant referee, it's not the wisest decision. Uh, but maybe Nicola Sturgeon could, uh, could take up um, where he left off and start running the line. We'll see. Anyway, good luck Douglas Ross this weekend if you're refereeing or assistant refereeing in Scotland. Also in the news this week is levelling up Secretary uh, Michael Gove. Um, it's been revealed that um, last week he spent two days at a summit about Brexit. The title of the summit, and I'm going to read this now, is uh, or was, How can we make Brexit work better with our neighbours in Europe? Um, and it included various Brexiteers uh, like Michael Howard, Norman Lamont uh, from the Tory party. Um, it also included notable politicians from, from the Labour party who were Remainers like David Lammy. Um, uh, it it uh, included some prominent business people, uh, the chairman of GlaxoSmithKline, uh, a huge pharmaceutical company, and also one of the managing directors from uh, Goldman Sachs, a huge finance company. Um, and uh, I suppose the main reason that you'll be surprised that Michael Gove might be there is that he was um, basically co-ran the Vote Leave campaign with Boris Johnson um, and told us everything was going to be hunky-dory and a piece of cake, a walk in the park, whatever you want. Um, certainly didn't give us any suggestion that uh, some seven years, uh, coming up on seven years after the vote, uh, we'd still be struggling to work out how to make it work. Um, Apparently, this has gone down like a knackered lift with Rishi Sunak, who uh, is not best pleased that one of his cabinet has effectively gone off book um, and uh, and popped over to this summit and gives a lot of ammunition to people like me who can't stand the Tories. Um, I think they lie to us all the time, and Brexit was a huge example of that. And finally... Uh, and finally, I feel like a proper newsreader. Um, a dog on a skateboard. Now, that would be better, actually. I'd rather see a dog on a skateboard than this guy. Um, last week, we had our first ever Tory in Focus feature um, in our first ever episode. And our Tory in Focus last week was 30p Lee, uh, the guy who claimed that people using food banks need to budget better and it was possible to make a meal, uh, a nutritionally balanced and healthy meal, for just 30p. Um, 
he uh, he's the MP for Sutton in Ashfield, son of a coal miner, you may remember, and he is uh, now the deputy chairman of the Conservative Party. A lot changes in a week. No sooner had I edited the podcast and put it out there, uh, uploaded it on all of the platforms, which takes some time for your first ever episode, than uh, he had been promoted in the latest cabinet reshuffle to deputy chairman. Rishi Sunak decided to reshuffle his cabinet in an attempt to strengthen his position in the party. And in, in actual fact, to anyone looking from the outside, it just looked like someone shuffling deck chairs on the Titanic. Um, but uh, Lee Anderson was promoted to deputy chairman. Um, and yeah, it will be interesting to see how this will play out. He's already um, gone on record as saying that the next general election, they need to, the Tories need to find something else to fight about. Because at the last general election, they had Boris in their corner, they had Corbyn in the other corner, and they had uh, Brexit. And those three things are things they can't argue about anymore. Boris is gone. Corbyn is gone and Brexit is a clusterfuck so um, they're going to have to find something else and he believes um, these the three things will be immigration shock horror and then culture wars I'd love for anyone to ask him what that means by the way and trans debate so expect the Tory party to uh, lurch towards transphobia um, culture wars if anyone can tell me what that really means. It sounds like bigotry. It sounds like general hate of anything other. Um, and uh, and immigration, which could well fit under culture wars, I suppose. But that's Lee Anderson's recipe uh, for electoral success. Um, the other nice bit of news that made me laugh this week was that uh, his in his constituency, the Liberal Democrats, put together a leaflet um, challenging him, attacking him really, for various of the uh, unpleasant and unsavoury things he's had to say. Um, and he, uh, he basically said to them, he, that he was so sure of winning he tweeted um, deliver, deliver 48,000 to my constituency office and I'll hand them out myself um, nice cocky reply um, and so they did they boxed up 48,000 leaflets took them to his, his constituency office um, to be distributed by Lee Anderson as promised and his parliamentary team his constituency team sorry uh, refused delivery and Lee Anderson later said that um Far from being a broken promise by a Tory MP, as the Lib Dems heralded, um, that it would have been illegal for him to distribute those leaflets, um, which makes you wonder why he promised it in the first place. Um, so he is fast becoming um, a real figure of of um, incredulity. Really, it's it's impossible to think this guy's earning, you know, eighty odd thousand pounds a year serving people. Um, in the in his constituency, with the way he behaves, he's he's sort of replaced Nadine Dorries and and Michael Fabricant as the sort of main figure of of uh, fun mixed with disbelief in the Conservative Party. Him and Jonathan Gollis. Jonathan Gollis is just a nasty bastard, a horrible person, um, and and you know really unpleasant but uh, Lee Anderson has got something a bit more about him a bit more uh, charisma but some really abhorrent views let's for, not forget he is the son of a coal miner um, and he's now the deputy chairman of the party that destroyed the coal mining industry and subjected miners to all kinds of abuses during the 1980s and the miners strike um, so yeah watch this space for more Lee Anderson news um, anyway Let's move on. Hello, you. Okay, this week's guest, as I've already said, is Paula Sheriff. Um, and uh, before we get Paula on, I mean, it, there's no real mystery about who she will pick when asked for the Tories she's had the biggest problem with because the whole nation saw her have the problem with him. And so... I don't think it's a big spoiler to say that the, the, the Tory she chooses is Boris Johnson, the former Prime Minister. Um, and in the in the interview you're about to hear, she does talk about two incidents, one the one that made the news and one that didn't. And both of them show something, tell you something about the character of Boris Johnson. Now, <clears throat> what I thought would be good this week is before the interview, just to share and refresh your memory about the, the incident that certainly made the news and... 
just bear in mind that the con you'll hear about the context in the interview or the stuff that led up to this, but also the fallout from it. Um, the, the fallout from the both the confrontation and the general issues involved, you know, prominent politicians uh, and not so prominent politicians in the Labour Party particularly getting death threats and rape threats and things like that. So it's not always funny, this stuff. Some of it's really fucking serious. So just, just have a listen or a watch, um, refresh your memory, and then we'll go straight into the interview with my very good friend, someone I very much admire and respect, former MP for West, uh, for Dewsbury in West Yorkshire, Paula Sheriff. Paula Sheriff. Thank you. Mr Speaker. I genuinely do not seek to stifle robust debate, but this evening the Prime Minister has continually used pejorative language to describe an Act of Parliament passed by this House. And I'm sure that you would agree, Mr Speaker, that we should not resort to using offensive, dangerous or inflammatory language for legislation that we do not like. And we stand here, Mr Speaker, under the shield of our departed friend, with many of us in this place subject to death threats and abuse every single day. And let me tell the Prime Minister that they often quote his words, surrender act, betrayal, traitor, and I for one am sick of it. We must moderate our language and it has to come from the Prime Minister first. So I would be interested in hearing his opinion. He should be absolutely ashamed of himself. I think, Mr. Speaker, I have to tell you, Mr. Speaker, I, 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 I have to say, Mr. Speaker, I've never heard such humbug in all my life. Because uh, the, the, the reality is, this is a, this is a bill. This is a bill. This is a bill. Order. 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 Excellent. So, uh, welcome, Paula. Um, how are you doing? I know you're full of cold, so thank you very much for doing this. I hope you're not feeling too rough. Um, Today's but... episode is, is brought to you courtesy of, of, of Tea and Beecham. So all That's... the other, other plans are available. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, yeah, thank you for doing this, even though you're not feeling well. Um, and so you were MP for my constituency, Dewsbury, from 2015 to 2019. Um, yeah. And um, we, I think we first met um, at the recording for The Rose shortly after Joe Cox was, was killed, um, which was a really emotional time. But since then, we've become friends. And um, I actually, you asked me, bizarrely, to appear on your election leaflet in 2019, <laughs> um, despite the fact no one's ever heard of me. And I, I've now spent the last four years or three and a half years thinking it might be my fault that you didn't get re-elected. Um, so I apologise for any votes I cost you. Um, oh my goodness, no, I'm, I'm pretty confident that you weren't the reason. Right? <laughs> I hope not. But I apologise <laughs> to the people of Dewsbury for what we've been left with. Um, uh, so yeah. without wanting to kiss your ass, um, even though I know it's got a, a Labour rose tattooed on it. Um, <laughs> who told you that? Who told me that? Well, it's common knowledge around these parts. <laughs> no. um, so, um, without wanting to kiss your ass too much, um, I genuinely thought you were a superb MP. Um, and would you say your biggest achievement was uh, the work around period poverty and the tampon tax? Would that be what you'd sort of hold up as? Yeah, I mean, I am. I'm really proud of that. There's, there's, there's no moving away from it. And, and when we talk about the the work we did around the tampon tax, I think everybody assumed it was around that five pence in the pound. And of course, that was part of it. That was, but that was sort of a peripheral part. What we were looking to achieve, and what I think we did do, was evoke that global conversation around menstrual health. Yeah. It was really, really important. Women and girls around the world were suffering and still are, and it felt like it was so taboo and it was so stigmatized. And even in the House of Commons, people were really shocked, you know, that we were raising this this issue. Mm. Um, you know, there was there was some MPs, you know, I'm thinking of a particular MP who was sort of an octogenarian, and he was outraged, you know, that we dared mention the word tampon, you know, in the mother of parliaments or, or said the word vagina. Yeah. You know, and, and, and it was so important and, and, and period poverty sort of followed on from that. And um I sort of became known as a women's health campaigner. 
I'm I'm really proud of that. It's yeah. something that you know I, I still I still try and do keep my hand in. Yeah. Um, I'm really really passionate. I'm I'm you know really proud to be a feminist, and um and like I say, it's so important that you know there's loads going on in the NHS at the moment. Of, of course there is, and of course it's important about ambulance waiting times and A and E waits and all those things. But also we mustn't drop the ball on women's health. Mm. No pun intended. You know, it, it's really, really important. I agree. Um, so, so I'm, yeah, I'm hoping to be able to, obviously I've, I've been ill for quite some time, but I'm, mm. I'm hopefully, apart from this cold, getting a bit better. Um, and I'm hoping to be able to sort of pursue um, doing some writing and, and, and other things uh, on, on women's health and perhaps Brilliant. a bit more being, who knows. Yeah, good. Well, so I mean, as the as the father of a teenage girl, you know, thank you. Um, and it's it's definitely had an impact. I mean, I um, I know that uh, I go to the football at Huddersfield Town just down the road, and I know the uh, I love that mug by the way. Uh, I, the uh, the toilets there have now got free sanitary supplies in for the for the ladies, and you know, little things like that, just little moments like that that really suggest the needles moved a bit, and you played a massive part in that. There was a technicality that you made history in doing that with the first non-front venture to I don't really fully yeah. understand it all but what was the, what was the actual technical technical record you set so I was the first backbencher in parliamentary his, history to get an amendment passed on a government budget that's amazing so traditionally, traditionally a government would never obviously um like give in if you like yeah. you know and accept a, a, an opposition um amendment and um and, and, and we played a blinder not not just me you know th th there was somebody in my team a guy called Nick um, who who was who is you know got a brain the size of a large country, and he was able to sort of um, look at the mechanics of how we would yeah. get this through. And it, it also involved me sort of chasing ministers down the corridor and them um, jumping into offices to try and avoid me because mm. you, you know the, the campaign it was a joy, Graham, because it was so wholesome. Yeah. And that's how, you know, I'm very conscious that might sound a bit cheesy. You know, but I still absolutely, from the bottom of my heart, believe that politics is a great platform for achieving change. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, I know that. I understand why people get fed up with politicians. I really do. Um, and particularly some of them, you know, the ones that are on the take and the ones that, you know, do things wrong and, and things mm. like that. But but there's also opportunities, like I say, to, to make that that lasting change. Mm. And, um, and it, like I say, we knew we had public opinion on our side, and it, and it was it was kind of a question of ethics. You know, we were charged, we were classifying period products as luxury items. Mm. Like, you know, that, that, it's crazy. That, that wasn't right, and yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely crazy. Yeah, I think um, yeah, it's you know, considering you you effectively served one term as an MP, four and a half years, yeah. And, yeah. and you know, to make such a big mark in that time is is quite unprecedented I think from my knowledge of politics which is relatively yeah. sort of limited but I do take an interest so well done and, and it, I think as, again as a, as a constituent it was just one of those things that it's nice to see your MP making a mark as well you know and, and certainly in I mean, the last that, that... few years we haven't had the same joy unfortunately but um, you know <laughs> the yeah, quick yeah. eye roll there but you know it's, it, it's, it's nice to see. That said Graham, I think you know that, that was sort of that campaign was really important to me. But, you know, I was also really proud of the work I did in the constituency. Mm -hmm. You know, I was very, very um, visible. I was very active and very approachable. And, you know, I loved going to the community events. I loved being around people. I still do. You know, I'm very much a people person. And, you know, I'm proud of some of the advocacy that me and my office team did for people. Mm. You know, they wrote to us. They had a problem. Sometimes yeah. we were the last resort. And they came to us in a, you know, in a, in a very emotional state, yeah. you know, with difficult problems. And we weren't always able to solve them. You know, we don't have, we didn't have a, a magic wand, but some of them we were. And, you know, it was really, really rewarding, you know, when people would write back to me and say, you know, thank you. Yeah. You've, you've, you've done this and by doing that, you've made our lives, you know, much better. And a lot of that goes unseen by the sort of the wider public, which is, oh, absolutely, you know, yeah. I suppose that the MPs who, who are good constituency MPs would love to be able to, to almost shout about every case when they, it's thrown in your face yeah. and you, know, you never hear or whatever. And I think people don't yeah. understand, you know, I know this this podcast is sort of primarily targeting, you know, removing the Tories from office, but MPs across the board, it's a tough balance, isn't it? You know, it's particularly the further your constituency is from London, four days a week yeah. in London, and then you've got to come back and, you know, it, it can have a, a, a toll. And you, you sadly got ill 
Uh, was it was it towards the end of your time as an MP or was it shortly afterwards? It, it was shortly after, so I lost my seat in December and I was talking to somebody the other day about, about losing my seat and, and I was trying to explain, you know, like, you know, normally when you lose a job and I've been lucky never really to have sort of lost a job as such, yeah. never been fired. And, and you know, it happens in an office, doesn't it? Mm. Just usually two of you. You know, but there's something really public about when you're an MP and you lose your seat on national telly, you know, and everybody can see you and you're trying to sort of, you know, you try not to break down and, you you know, in your head, your head's just kind of so many things go- going on. Um, but yeah, so I lost my seat in December and then in February, so about eight weeks later, um, I found a, just out of the blue, um, I found a, what can only be described as a, a thickened area on my left breast. And um, no history of, of, thankfully, of breast cancer in my family, although my dad's a survivor of, of bowel cancer. Um, so, you, you know, having been a, such a, a big advocate for women's health, thought, right, Paula, <coughs> excuse me, um, you need to go and get this sorted. Went to my GP. My GP was like, oh, there's nothing to worry about, but, but, but you know, let's refer you anyway, just, just to be sure. Mm. So got an appointment. And the irony was I was driving to Pinterfield's Hospital in Wakefield, and um, I was listening to the radio. It was budget day. So I think it was about the 10th of March. And Rishi was delivering the budget. Mm-hmm. And he mentioned me by name. He actually said, and I have to commend Paula Sherry for, because it, it, it was actually announcing that the the uh, abolition of the tampon tax was coming yeah. into force. So he mentioned me. So I was kind of driving. I thought, oh, God, that's kind of ironic, you know, that I'm on my way to, to the hospital. And so went to see the surgeon, he examined me, took on my history. He said, no, the, the, you've nothing, I'm not worried at all. In fact, he couldn't feel anything. Um, so, but 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 given I was there, they sent me for some scans. And um, that same afternoon, uh, I was diagnosed with, with, with breast cancer. They found, um, they, they did find something on the scans. And obviously, um, you know, it was without any shadow of a doubt, the worst day of my life. It was, um, it was, it, it was devastating. Mm. You know, even now, sort of nearly three years on, you know, it it it, it affects me, and I'm really, really passionate, and I'm, I'm doing some work at the moment around how I think it's really important that you know, from somebody who's who had breast cancer, looking back at how what I wish I'd known then that I know now yeah. when I was diagnosed. Does that make sense? Yes, so it does, it's yeah. about, and it's about sort of working with clinicians as well. To sort of say, you know what, Th- this might be any other day for you. You know, this is what you do every day. You do biopsies, you, you, you do, you, you read scans, you, you, you know. But for me, that was the worst day of my life. Mm-hmm. You know, so, and, and, and don't get me wrong, my care was, was, was excellent. Yeah. It, it was during COVID, so it wasn't without its um, challenges, yeah. let's say. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was actually during lockdown that I, I ended up having a, a mastectomy and all of the lymph nodes in my left arm removed. Um, so it was, you know, it was significant surgery. Um, and I think, you know, when we think about cancer, and I know we're not here, sorry. I'll, no, I know no, 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 listen, talk, you take as long as you want. I think when we talk about cancer, and I know it's something that's also affected your, your family, Graham. Yeah, a lot, yeah. I think, I think when we think about cancer, we, we think, oh, you know, you have your, your treatment, you have your, like, your, your surgery, and some people have chemo and, and radio, and, and I'm now on hormonal therapy for 10 years, which is hideous, let me mm-hmm. tell you. Mm-hmm side effects of the treatment are just beyond awful and um you think oh well you know when you've had all that you're fine but you know actually it's the psychological impact um of 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 being a cancer survivor and every time you get headache thinking oh god you know is is that a brain tumor every time you go to the doctor the doctors say oh i can see you're here with a bad stomach i can see you're also you've had cancer so we better just make sure it you know isn't anything sinister going on and and it you know, I'm afraid in some ways it's like a life sentence. Yeah. You know, in, in some ways. But, but that said, um, you, you know, I'm 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 grateful to be to be here. My cancer was it was a very large tumor. Um, in, you know, as far as sort of tumors go, and you know, I'm I'm, I'm obviously grateful that mm. you know that 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 it was here, and, and thank God for the NHS. Oh, absolutely. You know, because at the end of the day, you know, they, they, they treated me, and 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 you know, at no point did anybody say right, you know this is your bill or this is how much it's going to cost you yeah absolutely we're very i mean as you say in my family i always joke that we 
we might as well change our surname to Macmillan. We've had that many cases in the family, but it's, um, you know, my wife now is over 10 years cancer free from cervical cancer, but just last week was still talking about that fear, like you say, of your next yeah. scan, your next checkup, your neck, any aches and pains, backache, anything like that. Um, so I absolutely understand. And uh, I, I just think, you know, I'm grateful that you're okay now, but totally understand that it's going to be, casting a shadow for for a long long time um so but uh, let's get back to the politics stuff um yep. so on this podcast uh we tend to what i've started to do is only second episode so the format might change but what i like to do is get our guests to talk about two tories in particular and the first one is the tory you have a problem with now for most people this will be probably someone i've seen in the news someone at a distance but i'm guessing for you there's a chance it'll be someone you've probably been a bit more up close and personal with. So who would you say the Tory is you, you have the biggest problem with? Oh, my goodness. Uh, I mean, how, how long have you got, Graham? <laughs> I can edit um, it. It's okay, I can edit it. <laughs> like asking me to choose my, my favourite portaloo on, 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 on the last day of Glastonbury. <laughs> um, no, I mean, that, that, that isn't fair, to, to be honest. Um, the, Support the, the, Tory, <laughs> the Tory I will always have the biggest problem with is, is Boris Johnson. Yeah. Yeah. I think I said to you in the preparation for this that anybody else who was a guest on here, I'd probably have tried to steer them away from Boris Johnson because it was a bit obvious. But in your case, how can I? You've, you've actually got sort of, you've worked with or in nearby the guy um and you have personal experiences of him and, and one of those certainly was a big one that made the news but you you hinted at another one um before we get onto the big one that people might have heard of that you you had a so just to, to set the scene you you were um elected in 2015 at the time david cameron would have been prime minister yeah david cameron and, was prime minister when i was elected yeah yeah and then we had um theresa may for a couple of years from sort of 2017 sure. onwards and then, so was this running that you're talking about with Boris, was this while he was Prime Minister? Yes. So he, he came in... Oh, the, the previous, no, sorry, so the, the first, first one. one. No, he wasn't, he right, wasn't okay. Prime Minister. So fill us in there, what, what happened then? Because I know you had an issue with something he'd okay. said. So, so, like, you know, obviously I was a Labour politician. I'm, I'm Labour through and through. I think that's that's obvious. Mm -hmm. um, but, but And I'd always prefer a Labour government to any Tory government yeah. whatsoever irrespective of who the Labour government was was governed by. Um, however, you know, I, I was never a fan of, of Boris Johnson right from his London mayoral days. And um, th then when he he, um, he made a comment in, I think, a newspaper column, and he referred to Muslim women who wear the, 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 the niqab or the, the, the hijab as letterboxes. <coughs> and as you know, Graham... Um, we live in Dewsbury and mm -hmm. we have a large, um, we enjoy a large Asian population yep. here of Southeast Asian origin. And a number of our our um, women within Dewsbury choose to wear the hijab or, mm -hmm. or the niqab, which is absolutely fine. You know, I'm, I'm a great believer in, in, in you know, in empowering women mm -hmm. to wear it, but also empowering the women who choose not to wear it, if yeah. that makes sense. And... Uh, women after that happened women actually approached me in the street and some women that I also knew and they said to me you know will you tell him that you know the impact of what he said about about us being letterboxes you know they were unequivocally and universally offended by it you know mm -hmm. nobody found it funny, and particularly you know where you know the the the, the, the are sort of you know sort of such great projects going on and including around here around cohesion mm. and then somebody a decision maker an influencer like him comes forward and says something like that and it, and it puts us back so yeah. many years yeah. <coughs> and frankly plays into the plays into the hands of the you know the far right movement yeah and so i went up to him i saw him in, in just outside the tea room in parliament and I said, excuse me, can I have a word? And I'm not, I'm not really sure if he knew who I was, if I'm honest. And he goes, oh, oh, oh yes, yes. I said, um, I'd like to talk to you about the comment that you made around around women wearing the hijab and the niqab. I said, you know, do, do you realise that 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 as a consequence of, of, of that, you know, Islamophobic incidents actually rose significantly, exponentially during that period afterwards? And he, he, he denied that. He said, no, I, I don't believe it. I said, well, you know, women in my constituency have actually asked if I speak to you about that. And I think I have a duty 
you know, they've asked me to do it and I'm going to do that on their, their behalf. You know, I'm here to mm-hmm. represent them. And he goes, well, don't you think it looks ridiculous, referring to the, the kneecap? I said, I tell you what looks ridiculous, Boris. I says, you go running in those shorts. I says, I, I will always defend your right to wear them. I said, just like I defend the right yeah. for women, wherever they are, if they choose to wear the, the hijab or the niqab or the full burqa or, or whatever, that is their choice. And then, and that was the end. And did, so, do you think he sort of gave it any credence at all, or do you think he just, just shrugged his shoulders and moved on and forgot about it? Just his yeah. he, I think he, he uh, is. You know, in my mind, he's, he's a narcissist. Um, he is. I don't think he cares. Yeah. I don't think he cares. genuinely, and I don't say this. You know, I, I as I've said earlier, I'm not a Tory. You know, but, but the right Tory MPs whom I respect, yeah. and I recognise that the right Tory MPs who are in it for the right reasons, okay, yeah. we might have different politics and we might have different concepts of how you get to a final objective, yeah. you know, in terms of like making our streets safer or making our education yeah. systems better or, you know, all those things. You know, but but him, you know, he's, he's, he's just, he's, he's absurd. He's everything that is wrong with politics for me. Mm-hmm. You know, he's in it exclusively for himself i mean you know he's been going around the world doing all these blooming interview um you know speeches yeah. you know he, he should be an upspeed representing his constituents yeah he's still an mp which a lot of people seem to forget he's still including a, he's him still he seems to forget that as well um i heard i read somewhere that he's already <laughs> made i mean it's only about was it october that that he no hang on that was Liz Truss. that was the 49 days of Liz Truss. so it was september that he stood down so yeah, less than six right. months ago and he's made about five million quid off the back of it already yeah, apparently absolutely. And I'll tell you what I found really objectionable, Graham. Just going back to when I had cancer treatment, I went to every single one of my appointments on my own. Yeah. And I was blooming hard, let yeah. me tell you. You know, friends yeah. were dropping me off at the hospital. Even when I went in for my mastectomy, you know, friend mm. dropped me off outside the door. She wasn't allowed through the door. Mm. You know, I went, um, and, and, you know, sometimes you just want someone to cuddle you, someone to yeah, of course, yeah. Well, they were partying in Downey Street. Yeah, and this is why. So a lot of people will still now be that they will will never have understood why people got so angry about the whole party gate situation. But situations like yours and and those people who lost loved ones and all of that, you know, it's very easy to overlook those and just say, yeah. well, it was just it. The, but these are the guys that were telling you you had to go to hospital. Aren't you? Absolutely, and I, yeah. you know, I, I I obeyed by the rules. Yeah. I yeah. adhered to those rules because I thought, well, you know, it's important. Yeah, yeah, of course, you know, I want my friends here. I want my sister beside me. I want, you know, my mum, but but I couldn't do that, no. you know. And, and after my surgery, my sister came to pick me up to take me back up to recover at my mum's house for a couple of weeks. And we actually wrote to the police to get permission for her to drive from Cumbria to, mm. to come to Yorkshire because, you know, we were so, we, 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 we wanted to, you know, we wanted to ensure that we were sort of playing by the rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. the left, right, and centre, they weren't. Um, I think the other thing I would say about that, uh, you mentioned as well the area we live in, in West Yorkshire, and certainly our constituency and, and, and the neighbouring constituency in Batley and Spend, particularly quite a large Asian populations, also in Huddersfield, Bradford, all those areas in West Yorkshire. And what I've realised is if I, I pity the man who tries to tell. And uh, an Asian woman in our constituency what to wear. It, the, the, there's this concept among ignorant people that it's, you know, they try and make out or they believe that they're standing up for women's rights by saying they're being made to wear it. If I, every, Pretty much every Asian woman I know, I think if their husband told them what to wear, they'd be hell to pay. And, I, and I'd be fearing for that husband's yeah. well-being, you know. So it's like, it's so patronising, isn't it? That, Absolutely. That, you know, we have, women we of your generation or younger in, in these yeah. parts of the world are going to be so so subjugated that, you know, it's it's really patronising and it's, it's low-hanging fruit, isn't it? Absolutely. We have some formidable women right here, oh, you know, like it. you say, who, who, who you know, who, who would, I'm sure, give short, sharp shrift to anybody who, mm. who tried to sort of tell them what to wear. But like I say, those who don't want to wear it, that's fine too. Yeah, and they should, is, be, yeah. they should feel comfortable in saying, I don't want to wear it. You know, for me, I just don't have a problem, you know, and, and I just, yeah, it makes it, it just makes me sad. These people who, who genuinely seek to divide us and yeah. you know, and I know we're, we're both active on social media yeah. locally and we know there's, there's, it, it might seem sometimes like it's the majority, but it actually is the no, majority. No, it's a handful of idiots. On, on yeah, Facebook yeah. And, and they're commenting on all the local posts and the, you know, putting little digs in and little yeah. asides. And you just think, oh, mate, 
you know what, just like go back to your cave. Yeah. You know, they're probably sitting in the back bedroom in, in the room underpants, you know, eating a pot noodle and stuff, yeah. you know, it's like being keyboard warriors. It's, it's pathetic. Yeah, yeah. Just for any other listeners, though, at the moment, there's nothing wrong with sitting in your back bedroom in your underpants eating pot noodles. Just don't be a hate-filled prick. Um, <laughs> I would say. Um, so, but Boris Johnson, we're not finished with him yet because the, the story that people will know, because um, I didn't know that story, but it's totally, I totally, um, I can picture that in my head, particularly the bit where you gave him a dressing down. Um, but the story that everyone will know would be um, you you clashed with, with Boris in Parliament um, about some of the language he used um and you were very um impassioned it was probably the the closest i've seen. i don't know whether you would say you lost your call or not but i look at it and think jesus i've never seen paula like that before um so sort of riled up as it were um yeah. and then he he typically kind of um laughed it off the the way he always has um so um i'll i'll edit a clip in afterwards of of this for people yeah, to see but um just if you can refresh our memory about what led to that and then maybe the yeah, fallout absolutely. from that yeah i think it's really important that you understand the sort of context behind mm. what happened that day so that, that that day that sitting was was the day that parliament was reconvened after the illegal prorogation mm. so the supreme court had, had ruled that the the prorogation had been legal and therefore john burko the speaker at the time uh, agreed the house should 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 reconvene and therefore um it, it was that evening and and you know we talk about times when you can cut tension with a knife well my goodness i've never known an atmosphere like it you know in parliament or elsewhere so we were all sitting there and it was it was very very tense it was during the the brexit time which was you know in some ways was was just sort of the worst of politics um and we were sitting there and and boris johnson got up to speak and we weren't sure how he was going to act you know as a consequence of of being told that his prorogation had been illegal and um he <coughs> excuse me he kept using really pejorative language really inflammatory language so he was sitting there he was standing there sorry at the dispatch box and he was talking about surrender and betrayal and all these like you know all these um statements and as he was saying it like I was sat around, you know, on, on the green benches and there were some female MPs around me and we were saying, well, for goodness sake, you know, th this language, we, we can't carry on like this. You know, everybody had been subject to, to the most huge amounts of abuse and even death threats, mm. you know, during that period, because Brexit was really contentious, as, as you mm. can imagine. And um, and, and as, he, as he was speaking, it was being reflected on social media and indeed in our inboxes, you know, so people were e emailing us. So you can see the impact of, live there and then. Yes, what was happening. And, and I was sitting there and, 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 I, and I said to the people around me, you know, this is awful. And obviously I was always really conscious, you know, that, I mean, everybody felt the impact of Joe Cox's death. Of course mm. they did. I mean, it was, you know, again, a, a day that we'll never, ever forget. But, you know, it happened a few miles up the road. <coughs> Excuse me. So I was very conscious, you know, that words have consequences. And um <coughs> oh, sorry, Greg. It's, right, it's, right. yeah. it's, it's really unpleasant. Um so so I went to the speaker and I went up to the, the speaker's box and I said, Can I do a point of order? I said, because um you know, and that would sort of stop proceedings temporarily. Mm. And I said, but, you know, th th this language just isn't on and he just kept mm. doing it. It wasn't like he said it was. Yeah, it was a and, tactic, it was clearly you know, a chosen tactic. You know, but yeah. it, it, it was clearly totally intentional yeah. and, and, and orchestrated. So um so I went so I went up to the speaker and said, Can I do a point of order? He said, Paula, he said, I'm sorry you can't. He said, I've just turned down a Conservative MP mm. to do a point of order. I assume about something else. Mm. And he said, therefore, if I gave you one, it'd cause yeah. you know, ruptions. I said, Okay. So I went and sat back down and I said, and I had another idea. So I went back up to the speaker and I said, can I shoehorn what I was gonna say into a question? And he goes, Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. And then, so I went and sat back down and then Boris Johnson sort of finished his, 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 um, you know, his comments, his remarks. Then I, I was chosen almost immediately, which, which wouldn't be typical because there's a, you know, as many people might not know when you're in parliament and you're bobbing, which is when you stand yeah. up and down to indicate that you want to speak, there's a hierarchical system for yeah. calling you. Yeah. 
and it seems like you know privy councillors, chairs of committees, people with knighthoods. So you were further down office. the pecking order, as it were. Yeah, you're know, yeah. kind of like you know right down on you know in the cheap seats. And um, anyway, he called me almost straight away, so I was kind of taken unaware. Mm. And I know it sounds daft, but had I known that 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 clip was going to kind of go, you know go worldwide or go crazy. I have at least comb my hair and put a bit of lip on. Let, let's be honest. And um, and I stood up and do you know what? It wasn't rehearsed and it came entirely from the heart. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and yeah, and I told him, you know, and I stand by what he said. And in some ways, Graham, I kind of think I was one of the first to call him out, mm -hmm. you know, because I recognised back then what he was about. You know, he didn't care. You know, he, I, I basically stood up and said to him, you know, as a consequence of your language, Prime Minister, you know, you're causing us, and, and including many female MPs, mm. to get death threats, to get rape threats. I mean, the abuse was coming through. We're not talking one or two, Graham. Yeah. You know, we're talking sometimes hundreds a day. Yeah. And that is how we envisage. You know, we sent, you know, as, so, and then, I, and, and, you know, I made my point. I got a bit of a standing ovation, which I, I didn't yeah, expect. Yeah, I saw, on you know, my people, own who, side. people who look at the clip will actually see MPs on certainly on your side of the chamber applauding, which is not normally Absolutely. done, is no. it? And it's not allowed actually. Yeah. No. Um, and then the following day, um, I went obviously went back into Parliament, and and, a, and somebody who was in the cabinet at the time, who who, who I won't name because you, you know I, I, I have never named him, came up to me and he just said, "I am so sorry." He mm. was mortified, mm. you know, because Boris, when I when I when I finished my my remarks, um, Boris said, I've never heard such humbug in my yeah. life. You know, and, and, and you know, the sad thing, Graham, was that <coughs> over the next few days, my inbox was like, you've never known anything quite like it. Yeah. And it, and it was quite evenly split. There was, I, I got I got the kindest email from somebody and, and they put, you know, I hope you're okay. I, I just hope my granddaughter's growing up to be like you. No, and that, nice. You know, that, that sticks in my head. They were like, you're a strong yeah. woman. And, you you know, so many women said, like, God, you need, you said what you, you know, you, you were right. And, you know, we're so proud of you and blah, blah, blah. But but I also got a whole, I mean, I got thousands of pieces of abuse. It's... It, it, and, and including, including I think, four or five death threats that I had to go to the police. I mean, who on earth in their right mind? But who in their right mind, Graham, and this really, really kind of, you know, angers mm. me, who in their right mind would, would, would dislike someone enough to say, right, you know, I, I, I don't like the Tories. I don't like my current MP. Mm -hmm. Let, let's be honest. You know, his voting record, yeah, it, it's pretty poor. you know, leaves a pretty poor. Yeah. It leaves a lot to be desired. Yeah. You know, and, but I would never, ever write to him and say, you know, no. I, I, I I, you know, I wouldn't threaten violence. I wouldn't. I mean, I might write to him and say, like, you know, I, I think your voting record is, is shocking. Mm. You know, that's fine. Of course, you're an MP. You expect to get that that, that discourse mm. and that kind of, you know, that that criticism. But don't threaten to kill me. No, and you, I, I think the thing you know, that certainly is, as your constituent at the time, the thing that got me was that after your your sort of question to him, which was so passionate, but in which you managed to um, respectfully mention Joe um, and make clear what you were talking about, that he could stand up and be so dismissive, dismissive and flippant and... And he was a twat about it. He really, you know, I, I watched it, and when he said, "I've never heard such humbug in my humbug in my life," humbug in my life. Sorry. Um, he had sort of a that look of, you know, what an idiot on his face. And I just thought, how I ended. I, I actually spoke to. I rang in the James O'Brien show the next day. Um, I was on that because yeah, you you, on you'd been on it, and and he was after people. And as your constituent, and as, as someone who. I just thought I, I can't even remember what I said, but I remember basically just saying how disgusting I thought it was, and and how, given the the, the, the proximity to Joe's constituency and and that you knew Joe and you know all of that, how disgusting I thought it was. Um, and then I remember, and I can't remember if it was before or afterwards, but it's always stuck in my head. I bumped into you in Asda, in Dewsbury, and I asked you how you were doing, and you said you were fine, but that you'd had the police round that week installing more panic alarms at your home and it wasn't it, i don't know whether it was the use of the word more that got me but it was the suggestion that you'd already got 
this setup and they decided you need more. I remember coming home to my wife and saying, I, I just said, fucking hell, <laughs> you know, and I, I couldn't believe that, that, but I could as well. I was, I was shocked, but not surprised if that's right. You know, I was like, and, and I think that gave me a whole new respect for, for all MPs and what all MPs yeah. do, despite I'm the fact that I disagree with a large number of them. Um, I do respect I mean, I, he I, didn't I, give you. <laughs> you know. I maintain, Graham, that, that, that he, as a con, as a direct consequence of, of some of the stuff he said that day, that I received, you know, death threats on the back of that. Mm. And, you know, and, and in, like, you know, in Parliament, obviously, there's a, you know, there's often like rough and tumble. Yeah. And, 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 and despite what people may think, you know, Tories and Labour or whatever other, you know, Lib Dems, Greens, whatever, we often talk, you yeah. know, in the tea room, in the restaurants, we, 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 we even have a laugh. Yeah. You know, sometimes we sometimes talk about legislation, we sometimes talk about, you know, all different things. You know, we're not duelling constantly. Mm. The, the, the chamber of the House of Commons is very much a theatre or, or indeed a circus. You, you, you could call it, you know, but, but it's not like that. You know, we no. work in committees really closely together yeah. and we you know and um and and sometimes you might write a little note that's kind of the parliamentary thing you know the etiquette is that you know you'll write a note to somebody and say oh you know occasionally in the chamber you might kind of inadvertently upset somebody you might write them a note saying oh i'm really sorry i you, you know I, yeah. I didn't mean it to be quite so you know sharp or you know, yeah. you know something like that or nothing nothing <laughs> you know, not not so much. And this was like, at a know. time when, you know, it's like you say, with the prorogation of Parliament, and we had, um, you know, uh, High Court judges, Supreme Court judges being called traitors on national newspapers. Yeah, and yeah, all yeah. Of yeah. That. Um, enemies of the people. Remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'd had the yeah. the um, threats to other Labour MPs by far right, right groups yeah. that ended up with them going right, to prison right. and. That's the wider context. So while at the time it was quite an impressive, I suppose, clash in a way to see, it, that wider context makes it really quite Absolutely. upsetting. And, and, and I, I feel like you came out with that with a load of credit. I know that you got abuse. You got abuse on your appearance. You got abuse on your tone on the day. Um, and I just felt like anyone that was seriously having more of a problem with your approach that day than his is... I, I didn't really believe them. I felt yeah. like yeah. it was just an opportunity to attack people. Yeah, and I, and I completely agree with mm. that. And I mean, you know, just to sort of close off this section, but mm. but in, in the tea rooms in Parliament, it got to the point where, you know, we, we were sitting and we were talking literally how many death threats have you had in the last sort of few days, you know, and we were like, you know, exchange. And, and, and you know, my God. That's you know, almost that, surreal. If it wasn't so terrifying, and, that'd be surreal, wouldn't it? You know, and when, and when David Amos, mm. you know, was murdered, you know that deeply affected me. He was actually a, he was actually a friend of mine. Mm. You know, politically, we will probably you'd struggle to find two people more more different. Mm. You know, he was pro Brexit, anti choice in terms of abortion, and mm. you know I'm pro choice. I was a Remainer, I, you know, and 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 but we 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 were we were really we were good friends. I I, I loved him. He was a, mm. he was a he really was. He was the funniest man ever, mm. and he was and he was a kind man, mm. and. Uh, you know, and, and, and look what happened to him, yeah. you know, and, and, and we have to, you know, I don't know, there's something about the vilification, isn't there, of MPs? Mm. It, do you, you know, and, I want to say, we'll, we'll close this section off, but MPs, do you, obviously you're not in Parliament at the moment, no, um, but do you feel, maybe from talking to colleagues or former colleagues or generally, that in the last, I mean, it can only really be the last couple of months that things have perhaps returned to some sort of sanity, or is it still actually quite screwed up, but just not as screwed up? <laughs> no, I think it's still screwed up. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, the, 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 I've always been clear about what needs to happen. There are, you know, the, the, we, we, the police need to take things much more seriously. Mm -hmm. There's a very disparate response from different police forces. And this was something that was evident talking to other MPs as well. Yeah. You know, depending on where you lived and depending on who your commander was in that area. Some, some, I, you know, I got laughed at when I went to the police with a death threat. Yeah, well, you know, in West Yorkshire, you know, three miles from, from where somebody... Mm -hmm. and, and, in the same job have been murdered you know other, others had the same experience others had an entirely different i found the met police ironically much much better at dealing with it yeah. than my own police of course you know so um so that but i think you know we also need to look at things like restorative justice you know i'd love one of those blokes i'd love some of those blokes in jewsbury and i'm not going to name them but mm. you, you probably know some of the ones i'm talking about mm. you know to say what they said to me in front of their wives their mothers their yeah. sisters and their daughters 
you know, because I think, yeah, like I say, it's easy to say it on a keyboard, but, but you course, know, yeah. Say, <coughs> <coughs> but yeah, we need, and we need much more appropriate sentencing, um, you know, in the courts as well. You know, yeah. it ain't good enough. You threaten to kill somebody, you know, I'm, I'm afraid you, you know, if it's proved, you, you should you should be going. You know, you should be staying at Her Majesty's pleasure. For I a totally time. agree. Totally agree. Right. Okay. Let's move on to to oh, perhaps oh, more. <laughs> hey, you pop in the light. Excellent. Um, so, like... uh, excellent. So we'll just pop on to more um, positive ground. I think um, it probably won't be as long a lasting section though, as the Boris section. Um, but sorry, I'm going you've... for things, so I apologise. That's fine. Um, so obviously. You, you have worked closely with some some um, conservatives, and you, you've already mentioned David Amos. Um, which who would you say was the conservative? Maybe not that's impressed you most, but you probably have most respect for. Well, that's a really that that that's a tough one in terms of respect because I've got some conservative MPs that I consider friends. Mm. Not not a huge number, but you know a, a small number that I consider friends. But but. As as hard as I try, Graham, I, I cannot reconcile, you know, my head around their politics. I, yeah. I just can't, you know. And um, but but people like you know Tracy Crouch, mm -hmm. she she went through a cancer journey. Mm -hmm. Um, and interestingly, we both had the same unusual subtype of cancer. Right. Um, like one that affects fifteen percent of women with breast cancer. We we both had that. So, um, so so we've kept in touch and you know and sort of like g'd each other along a bit during mm -hmm. our respective sort of cancer journeys um and but Tracy and I were friends be, be, yeah. before um, before breast cancer if you like and yeah. you know we always had a, we always had a giggle together you know she was she's 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 great and mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, um I, I think she's she's fantastic like I say mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, we don't really we don't really talk about the politics and is, um, that, is that the way forward then as, a, as, as someone who's a frontline politician opposite sides of the chamber to find common ground, you kind of put yeah, aside absolutely. the actual yeah. politics. Is that what it is? You just talk yeah. about other stuff. And there is common ground. You, you, yeah. you know, like I, I was the, I was the chair of a number of what are called APPGs or part of parliamentary groups, and and they're groups that 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 come together on a, a very specific subject, and, and they have to be as a, a, a by by um, they they have to have cross party representation in order to be kind of um, allowed permitted, yeah. if you like. You know, and there's great, you know, cross-party work goes on in those. Like I say, you know, you, you tend to, not always, but there is a sense that you tend to sort of leave your politics at the door a little yeah. bit when, when we're, you know, in these in these discussions. I mean, there's some now that I admire, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know them because they were elected in 19, so obviously, you know, our paths have never crossed. But, you know, Alicia Cairns, I, I think she, some of, the, some of the interventions she's made, and, and I think... You know, she's become a select committee chair, and I think good on her. And mm -hmm. she's done some really good campaigning. And and she spoke out earlier this week around the uh, the Nicola Bully case, the missing woman, and about the fact that you know the police have have, have, have talked about the fact that she was menopausal, and uh, you know, and you just oh, I'm not That's sure about how, how yeah. much relevant, really. you know. And 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 also, um, although I, I really I don't like her politics, but I think she's a quite a formidable uh, performer, um, Deanna Davidson. Mm -hmm. Like I say, you know, like politically, uh, you know, again, you know, yeah. we're, we're, we're very You're, different. But 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 you could admire maybe the way they go about things or the way they conduct themselves, and and I suppose yeah. that's, that's important. Is what is and ties in with what you were saying about Boris earlier. Is that that because clearly you and Boris were never going to agree on politics anyway. But having some sense of decency, respect, going about things in a professional yeah. ways. You can admire that, even if you disagree that's, fundamentally yeah. on the basics. Yeah, it's exactly. Yeah, and and I think yeah, that, that, that's that's it in a nutshell. Yeah. Um. You know, I'll, I'll, I think it's fair to say I'll never be a Tory. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Or never kiss the Tory, as your mug says. <laughs> but yeah. Um. Yeah. Is that true? Is that true? Have yeah. you ever kissed a Tory? Get over that very quickly. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Yeah. Um, good. <laughs> well, no, not good. But yeah. You got better. You learned from it. Uh, not lately. Not lately. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Um, but um, but but you know, I think you know that the, there is something about sort of um, behaviour in in you know fr from certain MPs um, on both sides. Uh, so that was where we lost the interview. Um, 
unfortunately. We didn't lose much, but we did lose about five minutes. And the last five minutes of the interview were basically, uh, we finished up that little section talking about the importance of politicians treating each other with respect and dignity and conducting themselves in the right way. Um, and then we moved on to uh, the brief Do You Remember When section, which um, in which we covered uh, the time that Jacob Rees-Mogg said that he found the existence of food banks to be uplifting. Um, Paula's observation was that this just reflected merely how out of touch Jacob Rees-Mogg is and that that was seven years ago and even now it's even worse now. Um I, I made the observation that I felt that Boris Johnson, who we discussed earlier, understands the real world and doesn't care. Whereas I think that there's a very good real chance that Jacob Rees-Mogg's callousness for the real world comes from him not understanding it, not really living in the same existence. Um, and not saying one's better than the other, but I think that there's a, an argument for that. Um, so I'm sorry that we lost the rest of the interview. Um, I think Paul was a great guest. And it's a shame she wasn't very well either. And we might get it back on in the future. But thanks to Paula for coming on. And now we'll move on to our final section. Cheers. Time for this week's Tory in Focus. Okay, this is my third attempt at recording this week's Tory in Focus. Because the first time um, there was a knock at the door. And the second time the dog wanted to go out to the garden for a pee. So, this week's Tory in Focus, for the third time lucky, is Michael, it's definitely not a wig fabricant. Um, he uh, He's a Tory backbench MP, has been since 1992, so he's been an MP now for 31 years this year. Uh, he uh, He's certainly a career MP, shall we say. Um, he's in his early 70s, um, and... Um, he is or has been a bit of a figure of amusement, bemusement, scorn, ridicule, um, and uh, the wig doesn't help. I mean, I say it's definitely not a wig. I say that because he hasn't ever confirmed that it's a wig. Um, I mean, his wig is quite astonishing. It's astonishing. Um, he uh, he certainly fosters a certain look. Um, he hasn't ever really, as I say, risen to. Frontline politics is a backbencher, um, but he is notorious and is well known. And one of the reasons he's well known, or and he's seen as perhaps a bit eccentric, is that he is very much prone to um, putting his his foot in it massively on social media. He um, he's one of the the guys who probably, if I was ever and heaven forfend, if I was ever in a position of being in a position of authority within the Conservative Party. Um, one of the first things I would do would be to call him in, ask him to uh, just accept boldness as his friend and deactivate Twitter. Um, most of his controversies have um, kind of centred around his inability to tweet whilst thinking. Um, a few examples. Back in uh, 2018... Um, the then US President Donald Trump was due to visit the UK London Mayor Sadiq Khan had um, been in, in control of or seen the request to fly a massive balloon of Donald Trump over uh, the city in celebration of Trump and um, had denied the right for him to do that to, for them to do that um, and um, <clears throat> the uh, there was a t an image that Michael Fabricant tweeted that depicted Donald Trump laughing um, with the headline, Breaking News, Trump defeats Sadiq Khan in balloon wars. And in the background over the Houses of Parliament is Sadiq Khan, or the head of Sadiq Khan on the body of an inflatable pig, which is being sodomised by another inflatable pig. This was seen as not only bad taste, but also very culturally insensitive, because London Mayor Sadiq Khan, a, a former colleague, if you like, of... Uh, microfabricants in Parliament um, is a Muslim and as many of you may be aware um, there are issues culturally sensitive issues around um, pigs in Islam as there are in Judaism um, and so whether or not it would be appropriate for any politician to be depicted being uh, fucked by a pig um, especially by a Tory MP who had served under David Cameron cast your mind back to last week and do you remember when um, the additional impact of, of him being a Muslim, it could could be argued that this is at, at 
best culturally insensitive and, and, a, and a touch ignorant, or at worst, a, a, as Islamophobic. Um, now, I'm not going to say which of those I think it is because I, I don't know what was in his mind at the time. Um, in other areas, um, just last year, 2022, um, he tweeted that uh, the online safety bill um, that was being proposed by the Conservative Party should have uh, an exemption under the section regarding what is termed cyber flashing, i.e. normally dick pics, for example, um, that the exe there should be an exemption for any sent over dating apps because they're fair game. It just makes you wonder what it gets up to on Tinder or Grindr. Um, he he tweeted, this was nearly 10 years ago, 2014, he, he appeared to have been watching and live tweeting a, a, a TV debate show which featured um, a journalist, Jasmine Ali Bai Brown, um, and he uh, he said he couldn't ever appear on a discussion programme with her because he would end up punching her in the throat. Um, okay, lovely, really good behaviour from someone who purports to be socially liberal. That's my dog barking in the background. Um he recently also tweeted um, a wee while ago. A constituent of his um, had tweeted um, about uh, him being a poor constituency MP, having um, neglected a particular area within the constituency. And um, Michael Fabricant called her a twat on on Twitter, and then blamed her for not having made it clear that she wasn't a Russian bot. So obviously it's her fault. So he called a 19-year-old constituent, one, someone that could actually theoretically vote for him, a twat uh, on social media and then blamed her for it. Um, probably the most abhorrent and ill-judged one was, um, you might remember not that long ago, there were allegations that a Conservative MP had committed some kind of sexual assault or rape um, within Parliament, um, or in, certainly whilst sitting in Parliament. Um, and um, the chief whip, the Tory chief whip, had asked that particular MP to stay away from Parliament while the investigation was ongoing. Um, and um, Michael Fabricant tweeted, "I'm going to read it word for word and describe how the tweet tweet looks. If you can't see this on your screen, if you're listening to this." Uh, this is about Prime Minister's questions. I'm expecting a strong turnout of Conservative MPs at Prime Minister's question today. Not only to de demonstrate their strong support for hashtag Boris, brackets, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, close brackets, capital letters, but also to prove that they are, capital letters, not the one told by the Chief Whip to stay at home. I'll be there, exclamation mark. And he finishes this tweet off with um, an emoji of a winking smiley face with its tongue out. Like that. Um, so joking about rape, I mean, as an MP, when one of your colleagues in your party has been accused of something as heinous as rape, joking in a light-hearted way that's sort of, huh, yeah, it wasn't me, uh, you know, it's just a bit off. Um, so he also relatively recently appeared on um, the Celebrity version of First Dates hosted by the delicious Fred Syriax. Um and um he 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 was the celebrity which um I believe Theresa May joked she didn't know if he was going to be the celebrity or the member of the public. Um he he appeared um and was set up on a date with a woman. Um he's bisexual and has a, a male partner. Um and um these two were both slightly it was it was an awkward exchange and to to leave with you now, I'll leave this with you now as the, the podcast closes. The particular awkwardness circulates around when she discusses his wig. Um, as you'll see, she is in no doubt that it's a wig and actually is in a way trying to compliment him by saying you don't need it. Um, and his reaction was just... Um, I suppose in a way it shows a, a human side, a slightly pathetic human side, I think, and a, one that almost made me pity him until I remembered all of the other stuff that he's been up to. So, um, uh, uh, Michael Fabricant um, is just uh, just an odd guy, I think. Um, I can't remember whether he's one of the MPs who said he's not going to stand at the next election or, or, or is, but I suspect at the age of... What is he, 72 now? He'll be 73 then. He'll have been in Parliament for nearly half his life. I wonder if his time should be coming to an end soon as an MP. Um, if not, 
keep an eye on his Twitter and see what he gets up to next. Uh, join us on the next episode of uh, Get the Tories Out. Um, I'll be speaking to uh, my good friend uh, Summerled, who is responsible for the, the song that we play at the end of this podcast, uh, the Tories Neck and Neck of the UK. Um, and we'll be talking to him about um, his um, recollections of last summer when uh, a parody song uh, that he put together um, was featured around the world on news broadcasts during the final hours of Boris Johnson's reign as Prime Minister and what it was like for him to to hear his song blasting out in the background of all these reports. Um, so do keep an eye out for that next week. and Like, subscribe, share, drop us a comment, um, get in touch if you want to, and uh, yeah, peace out and uh, get the Tories out. Take care. Bye-bye. I know a lot of people who are bisexual. Um, I have to say, there is a slight nuance in your manner that made me wonder about that. What, um, that I'm screaming gay or no, that I'm no, no, straight? I, What's the nuance that you're picking up on? I can't explain it. It's a vibe. So, the wig is a bit of a giveaway. Why do you feel you need it? Get rid of it. What's that got to do with price of meat? You're a nice person. You don't need it. Well, You're you know, fun and funny. Yes, but I'm not going to make personal comments about you. Well, you can if you like. I don't wish to. I think that's a rather rude thing to do. I am very yeah. sorry. I did not mean to be rude. It's yes. me. My okay. hair is me. OK. And if you like it, great. And if you don't, hard luck. I beg your pardon. Yeah, I just think making a personal remark seems I am very rather sorry. aggressive and unpleasant, actually. I didn't mean to be aggressive and unpleasant, really. Um, oh, what a showstopper. Fancy saying that. Get the Tories Out is a Gag and Bone Man comedy production hosted by Graham Rayner. Find us online at GTTO Pod and like, subscribe, and share. Thank you. You can't believe one word they say. The Tories, Naka Naka, the UK. Starve the children on holiday. The Tories, Naka Naka, the UK. Our feeders ain't to the UK. The Tories, Naka Naka, the UK. Work for anyone who'll pay. The Tories, Naka Naka, the UK. Owned by Putin and the USA. The Tories, Naka Naka, the UK. Au revoir to the UK. The Tories, Naka Naka, the UK. Covid rules, they then decay. The Tories, Naka Naka, the UK. Pay the mates, pretend to pray. The Tories, Naka Naka, the UK. River Dechi, the UK. Tories, Naka Naka, the UK. The BBC must just obey. Tories, Naka Naka, the UK. The NHS, they're trying to slay. Tories, Naka Naka, the UK. Adios to the UK. The Tories, Naka Naka, the UK. Turn away from our Calais. The Tories, Naka Naka, the UK. Tax free haven like a pirate bay. The Tories, Naka Naka, the UK. How feed us ain't to the UK. The Tories, Naka Naka, the UK. Au revoir to the UK. The Tories, Naka Naka, the UK. The Tories.